uh, you may be here on time, should penalize you, but I, I believe others will be uh, coming in. So, as indicated on the slide, I'm Scott Bitkiff, and I currently serve as the university's vice president for information technology and chief information officer. <clears throat> and so, basically, uh, sort of, I, I head the division of IT, and we have a number of units inside the division of IT, including our uh, Technology Enhanced Learning and Online Strategy that's kind of hosting this meeting for you. So thanks very much to the, the TLOS crew for doing that. And of course, we also have our Advanced Research Computing Group, ARC, that is uh, responsible for uh, helping our research community, all of you, uh, do great things in research and education with advanced computing, with uh, compute storage, uh, high performance networking, all those kinds of things. Uh, I, I think we're really uh, lucky here at Virginia Tech this year to have created really a partnership uh, between ARC and uh, the Brandon Park of Electrical and Computer Engineering, in fact, to create uh, this new system called Huckleberry, which is really different than any system we've built before different in terms of both the hardware and software that we run there, but what's really critical is serving a different application space, a different part of our research community by supporting deep learning. And so this system was not uh, some compute engine that we can do deep learning on. This was a system from ground up that was really acquired, deployed to support deep learning research uh, at the university. So I've been uh, tasked with providing a little bit of information about preliminaries. Uh, so first of all, uh, despite what the original schedule said, the hands-on portion of this workshop, which is tomorrow, will be in this room. So come back. There'll be a different configuration with tables and so forth in here. We'll have a smaller number of participants. But we wanted to be able to accommodate a lot of people today to get background information. And then for those that are really serious about things and want to get their hands dirty, uh, enlightened, or whatever, with hands-on learning uh, to be in the workshop tomorrow. Uh, if you are participating in the workshop tomorrow and have not done steps one, two, and three, that's your homework for today. Uh, so request the Huckleberry account. It's hands-on, so you need to be on Huckleberry to do the uh, workshop. You need to make sure you can log into Huckleberry, make sure your account's really set up, and there is online documentation uh, shown at the URL there. If you just go to arc.bt.edu, look under this, I think the exact title of the system, you'll find Huckleberry there as one of our computing systems, and that will uh, lead you to that, to that guide. So as I mentioned, this is really a state-of-the-art deep learning system that we have in Virginia, at Virginia Tech. We have uh, this partnership with ECD, and it's basically kind of our standard investment computing program, but at a much higher level. So uh, ECD has paid for 40% of the system. Uh, the university centrally has paid for the other 60%. 40% uh, of the capacity ECD will have priority access to, but the entire university community has access to the other 60% of that capacity. And so uh, we don't want just ECD researchers using it. We do. We want them. But we want researchers from across the university uh, using this system. Uh, it's been available now for about two weeks and uh, in terms of production use. And so uh, this is a workshop, great timing in terms of really getting people to the point where they can use this. Uh, day one of the workshop is going to be sort of the absorption day. Uh, we have. Uh, a number of uh, speakers and participants here. I really appreciate uh, folks from IBM, from uh, Mellanox, from Mellox, uh, who are going to be here today to uh, instruct this workshop. Uh, and so we appreciate that. So we'll get an overview of, of hardware trends and we'll uh, see something about the software as well. Then tomorrow is really the hands-on part, right? Getting hands-on experience with Jupyter Notebooks, NVIDIA Digits, TensorFlow, CAFE, Distributed Deep Learning. This is an overview of the system, and uh, I thank James McClure for putting these slides together. I'm not going to lead you through a, a detailed technical discussion of this, but that will come later today. 
Um, but what's unique about this system is that it's really, uh, I, I think about it in my little bit simplistic way, and, and folks from IBM can uh, correct me later in the program, but I think about this really as not a compute cluster with GPUs, but it's a GPU cluster, right? And a GPU cluster not designed for graphics or uh, sort of some of the thing, other things that GPUs get used for, but really for machine learning. But of course, you need to have some uh, processors there for control, general purpose kinds of things. And so uh, we have Power 8. And the really interesting thing about the IBM Power 8 NVIDIA combination is this NV link that really gives you very high uh, capacity interconnect between uh, the processors and, and the GPUs and memory. And um, there's also then Mellanox involved here in terms of interconnect uh, between nodes. So every node is very, well, every uh, processor is very capable, every GPU is very capable, every node is very capable, and then we really have a cluster of those nodes with fast interconnect, and so we have a very fast uh, system for uh, doing this kind of work. So I, my background is actually in electrical computer engineering, and I was reflecting back today a little bit about sort of how we've gotten to here. And I can remember going to a uh, symposium, a little presentation being done by a visitor when I was an undergraduate, my senior year. I'm going to date myself a little bit here. So that was 1978, right? So, so 39 years ago. And I, I've heard the same talk sort of more or less over the last 39 years. And the basic premise is, is that our semiconductor people have done great work, but they're running out of steam. Okay, so we're not going to be able to put anything more on the chip. The only way we're going to improve performance is through parallelism. That's how we're going to achieve performance. And there's a certain amount of truth to that every time it's said across the last 39 plus years. But it also is a little bit misleading. So in the last 39 years, we've seen tremendous advances in semiconductor technology. We're able to put tremendously more uh, transistors, tremendously more logic and memory on a single integrated circuit. And in fact, what I would say, what, what we sort of ran out of steam on was not semiconductor technology, but this, the ability to handle complexity in our designs, right? So we were forced into parallelism on the chip because of how do you sort of manage the complexity of design? And you end up managing that complexity through replication, replication of cores. And of course, GPUs take that to an extreme with a very really large number of several cores. So yes, we've been driven to parallelism, uh, but not quite for the reason uh, that was stated there. Um, in addition to uh, the, the sort of the, the, the fact that parallelism hasn't come along, uh, well, parallelism has come along. It's sort of driven by different reasons. And the reality is that we are, and will at some point, run up against the limits of physics. Our semiconductor friends will not be able to sort of continuously put more and more on a device, but uh, they, they continue to sort of do interesting things to get over some of those barriers. I think there's also this other premise that as I look back at that presentation and a lot of other presentations over the last 39 years, that uh, we're trying to achieve some computational capacity, and let's figure out how to do that. And the reality is that people like you in the room here and other people throughout the world, I don't care how much capacity we had, compute capacity or storage, you figure out ways to use it to improve your research, right? To do better science, to uh, improve machine learning. And so, uh, no matter sort of what, how much we can put onto it, a single integrated circuit, we have to figure out how to uh, do more and to use parallelism. And parallelism not just on the chip, but beyond the chip. And of course, that means that we have to worry a lot about interconnect because interconnect oftentimes becomes the bottle of that, not the compute. How do you communicate? And so as we sort of think about that 39 years, um, 
for those of you in the research community, and some of you have lived through that, and some of you have just kind of started to get into that world very recently, uh, we should all be very sort of grateful. You know, it's a great thing that we have this additional capacity. Um, but you're also all the victims of that, okay? Because to be able to really take advantage of sort of these technology changes, these new interconnects, you have to understand a lot. Uh, and so if I go back not 39 years, but about 35 years ago, uh, I remember it was actually a lecture in a class, actually probably more like 38 years ago. Uh, and you know what this faculty member was saying to the master's level class, that basically as an architect, you have to understand everything from silicon up to compilers and codes. And if you sort of look at the user end of that, too often over the last 39 years as an application user, as someone who creates applications with these rights code, you have to understand maybe not down to the silicon, but pretty close to it. Right? And that's painful. And it changes frequently. <coughs> now, the hope is that as we look at software platforms, that uh, other smart people, in addition to people using these systems, figure out ways to hide some of that complexity, present the right kinds of abstractions <coughs> to let you think about your problem, your domain, your deep learning algorithms, what you're trying to do with the system, rather than having to worry about exactly how it's configured, all the details of the hardware. I would suggest that we're not fully there yet, uh, but we've made a lot of progress. And so, as you kind of come into this, I would, uh, you know, I, I think we're really lucky to have an opportunity to learn about some of these tools, deep learning frameworks, the supporting libraries that are hiding a lot of the complexity of what's underneath there. But also you have to recognize that if you really want to get the most out of this machine that you can, you can't be completely oblivious to the challenges of sort of what's underneath in terms of the internet. And so you have to think not just about your algorithm, but at least some about what it's right about. And so I think we have a really good program today with leading us through some of the hardware trends, where we are, where we might be going, but then also in trying to really get our work done as a research community, how do we hide some of that complexity, but how do we also have to recognize still some of that complexity. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity for uh, 